This morning, we are continuing with our Lenten journey as we turn in the Gospel of Mark to the first chapter. We're going to start with verse 4 and go through verse 15. Remember, we're on a sermon series called The Path to the Empty Tomb, and each Sunday we're looking at stepping stones along the path, and today we read the very beginning of Mark's gospel and how Mark frames the story beginning for Jesus through the lens of John, his cousin, John the Baptist, or as we will read, John the Baptizer. So I invite you to read along either in your pew Bibles, in the bulletin itself, or if you have a smartphone or other device, you can read along, certainly, along with us. We'll start with verse 4. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after Jesus was arrested, Jesus... After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Now last week we talked about the first stepping stone looking at Mark chapter 8. That was the the stone or the step of letting go. Before we're able to respond to God, we have to learn to let go of the things that keep us stuck where we are. And today we turn back to the beginning of the Gospel of Mark to see the second step or the second stepping stone. And that is the step of turning around. See, once we let go of the things that are keeping us stuck, The question is, what direction will we go? We're called by Jesus, as we heard last week, to to follow Him. To even pick up a cross and follow behind Him. And that is possible with this step of turning around. Changing our direction and following Jesus as our Lord. This is an important decision and not one to put off. This past week, I went to the dermatologist for the first time in a decade. Do you know why I went? It wasn't because I thought, well, it's important to go. The reason I went is because something appeared on my skin about a month ago. Now, thankfully, it's just scar tissue. But it created that scare in me. To wonder, what in the world could this be, and could it be something harmful to who I am? I went to the dermatologist because something popped up, and I was worried about it. I had neglected going to the dermatologist for a decade because everything was fine. Most of that teenage acne was gone. I didn't have to worry about it. But now, all of a sudden, what I had been neglecting became vitally important because of the unknown. And that got me thinking this week with all the snow and ice that we went through. What else are we neglecting in our lives? What do we neglect in our lives because things seem to be going just fine? 
I've known people who have neglected checking their tire pressure because everything's fine until all of a sudden it looks dangerously low or there's a flat tire. I've known people who neglect changing the air filters in their home because everything's just fine until all of a sudden something breaks down in their HVAC system. That's the way we are, isn't it? When things are going just fine, our mind and our attention goes to those more pressing things and we neglect those important things that sustain us that we take for granted. We often take our finances for granted. We neglect them until we get that low cash balance alert. Or we, when we neglect our mental and emotional well-being until all of a sudden we start to notice or others start to notice signs of stress or depression in our own lives. When things are going well, we often neglect those vitally important things that sustain us. Instead of paying attention to them, we, in a sense, take our foot off the gas and we just coast. Because we feel like we can trust in those areas. Everything is going fine. And we move our precious time and attention to those other pressing things. We neglect those vitally important steps. And that can be destructive or damaging to our lives in the long run if we're not careful. Then, I think, is something very similar in our lives. Sin is something that we often neglect until we start to see the negative outcomes of them. Now in the Bible, sin is often described as missing the mark, as if an archer is looking at a target and lets go of that, that arrow and it sails and it does not hit the bullseye, it does not hit even close to the center, it might hit on the edge or it might miss completely. Sin is that intention that we, we want to do what's right, we want to hit the target, but we keep missing the mark. It goes astray. And that understanding that comes from that is that we know the good and right path. We know what God expects for us, and yet we wander to the side. We wonder, wander away. Sin, sin is what happens when we neglect the good path the good life, the good actions that God asks and demands of us. And a lifestyle of sin has a way of compiling and rotting away joy, contentment, happiness from the inside out. When our lives seem okay, we, we tend to ignore the spiritual sectors of our lives. We tend to take our spiritual relationship with God for granted. And we slip further and further into patterns of living and acting that are out of tune with God. But at first, when we're neglecting these things, it's just a little bit. It's not something to really get worried about. We're just going through a phase, maybe. And yet by neglecting this relationship and by not worrying about how we are slipping into sin, left and right and center, eventually we find that we're in a deeper hole than we intended. See, sin, sin is something that we care about, but not enough to nip in the bud at the beginning. Most of us will admit, yes, we struggle with sin. But when push comes to shove, we believe that we are very good people. That we don't really worry about sin that much because sin is what happens to Aaron Hernandez or Ray Rice or Tiger Woods and not to us. We're closer to the mark. We're closer to the bullseye than they are. And so, by comparison, we're okay. If our lives are mostly together, we don't really worry about sin if we're honest. We just go about our lives taking our foot off the gas and coasting. And by neglecting this, this path, by neglecting what God expects or hopes for us, 
we end up coasting in the wrong direction. In the bulletin for today, I asked you to imagine someone on a road trip who suddenly realizes that they're going in the wrong direction on the interstate. And what happens if they decide not to turn around? They keep going and going and going in the wrong direction, becoming further and further and further away from their destination. I had a friend going to Florida to go, to go and visit some family, and they got on the interstate, and they realized, unfortunately too late, that they were running low on gas, and they looked up at where they were on the interstate, and they were in the Florida Evergate, Everglades. Thankfully, they, they took a risk and turned around in one of those little areas that says, do not turn here. And they got back to their exit, thankfully, because the next exit was 25 miles down the road. In our spiritual lives, we take sin seriously, we think, but we end up coasting, and we end up getting on that interstate, and we keep going and going and going, thinking there always will be a possibility for a U-turn. Spiritually coasting. If we look at sin, and if we look at grace this way, guilt is that piece of spiritual emotion that is necessary in order to get us to turn around. And churches have used guilt for centuries to try to get people to move and to turn around. Once you and I feel guilty enough about spiritually coasting, we seek to change our ways and to accept God's grace. And some churches have used guilt so much and so often that they have turned people away. Maybe even for good. Other churches have reacted so much to churches, other churches using guilt to get people to change their lives that they don't talk about guilt or sin at all. And so we're either stuck being beaten to death by the guilt stick or not talking about it at all and we continue to coast down that highway. So the question for us today is this. What is repentance and why do we need it? And if we do need it, why are we not turning? Thankfully for us, we have a picture of some of these instances in Scripture. Jesus, who we believe to be the Son of God, the one who shows us the complete and utter picture of God's heart broken open for humanity, walked and talked with people. The very Son of God came in close contact with people like you and I. And the criticism about Jesus is that He ate and drank with sinners, tax collectors, people of ill repute. He befriended them, shared a meal with them, and invited them to follow Him. He did not keep sinners, whether they were just getting along fine or if they were mired in their sin. He did not keep them at bay. He invited all of them to be with him. But Jesus rarely used guilt in order to get people to change their direction. In fact, most of the time, he used love and compassion, restoring people to the good and right path and asking them, if you want a good life, if you want to be a part of who I am and what I'm doing, join me on this path. Jesus shows up to people who are coasting along fine and who are mired in sin, and he offers them grace. He offers sinners who have their life together grace. Grace. 
Grace is what God offers to each and every one of us. Grace that comes to us as we are, even if we have missed the mark by inches or by a mile. And grace, grace does not mean to beat us down, but to lift us up, to get us ready to join Jesus on the path. He preaches God's grace to people who are broken as well as those who have their lives together. To everyone, he preaches grace. To clean up their lives, not to impress God, but so they will be ready for the journey ahead of them. When John and when Jesus show up on the scene in the Gospel of Mark, they're talking to sinners. Sinners sinners who need to be on God's path. And they're invited to turn. To turn around. To stop going into a direction that is either in the slow lane or the fast lane. A direction that is going towards something that is destructive. And Jesus and John both invite them to turn their lives around and get on the good and holy and right path. People are streaming. Streaming in from the wilderness. Streaming in from Jerusalem. They're going out to meet John and to hear that there is something other than what they have been a part of their entire lives. John and his baptism, there in the waters of the Jordan River, the baptism of turning around is referred to in in the church as metanoia. Metanoia is that repentance, that change, and it's best described as a 180 degree turn. People streamed out into the wilderness to hear John and hear what he had to say, and the very first thing he said was, come in, Get into the water and metanoia. Turn your life 180 degrees. You've been going in this direction and it's time to stop coasting or stop going in that direction as fast fast as you can. Turn and get back on the good and right path because there is someone who's about to show up who is going to lead you down that path. For John, sin was living apart from God or at least going in the direction opposite of what God would want. Both in small ways and in the large ways. Sin is what clogs our ears to the call of God. It's what confuses our lives, thinking that the things that we're going towards are actually meaningful when they're not. The baptism in the Jordan River was an opportunity for people to turn their lives around. To turn away from all those things that rise up and trap them so that they would, as they reach the shoreline, be freed to go in that good and holy direction. John and Jesus, both here in the beginning of the Gospel of John, of Mark, excuse me, they do not leave open the possibility of coasting in our lives neglecting the small sins that we take for granted because, akin, there are other people that we compare ourselves to that are more sinful. No. Both John and Jesus, from the very beginning of the gospel, lay out grace upon the table and say it's open and offered to each and every one of us. None of us is better than the other. Grace is out there on the table. It is ready. We don't need to feel guilty about the past. We need to let the past be the past. It's time to turn. Take a step out in faith. We take take God's grace as a free gift. We turn our lives around. We turn our backs on life apart from God's grace. And we point our ears our eyes, our hearts, and our feet in the direction of God's path, ready to follow where he leads. If you find that you're spending too much time worrying about your life or your future than you do about prayer or that you do about service to others, it's time to turn around. 
If you find that you spend more time trying to fit in a sporting event or that weekend Netflix binge than you do into fitting into worship or Bible study with other Christians into your life, it's time to turn around. And if you're too busy lambasting other sinners for their poor decisions without pointing your own life in God's holy and right direction, it's time to turn around. Don't wait a decade. Don't put it at the end of your to-do list. Don't wait for the appropriate time. Turn and walk. Amen. Amen.